Well, good morning, and welcome to the Guilford Community Church on this, the first Sunday of September. I forgot to include communion, but as is our tradition, we typically on the first Sunday of the, of the month gather around the Lord's table. I hope you picked up your communion elements as you came in the sanctuary. If you didn't, um, raise your hand. Excellent. Looks like everyone has been served. That's wonderful. The beautiful, the beautiful flowers under the cross are from the memorial service celebration of life for uh, Doug Moyer. It was a wonderful celebration of his great life. And um, just thanks for everyone who helped uh, work on that service, especially the people who made the reception following it so wonderful in the absence of Eloise Post. And if you notice, there's a big piece of equipment in the corner of the parking lot. And that's because we're, we have begun the solar energy project. They're putting solar panels on the back of the youth center. At, uh, it's been one week since the project commenced and it'll probably be another six or seven days and then we'll have complete solar panels and probably that will address all of our electric needs for the church. So we're really, really thankful for that and proud of all the congregation's support. And now I just invite you to take a moment to reflect on why we've gathered here today. This first piece is called Morning Mist. Um, and it's by William Billingsley uh, and uh, obviously Will Gunn on the piano.
Thank you, AJ and Will. That was beautiful. Please join me now in a word of prayer. On another beautiful morning, we gather to this safe place. We gather to help us keep things in perspective, to catch our breaths from busy weeks, to greet our neighbors, to open ourselves to insight and intuition of that greater reality of which we are a part. We gather to raise a joyful song, to reconfirm our desire to seek wisdom and love, to strengthen our commitment to the common good. We come from many paths to explore that which is most important, to consider the ways of our, the ways of our heart, to acknowledge how we have stumbled to heal what is broken. Thus do we celebrate the grace and gift of life and practice our faith to the greater glory of the Spirit as did Jesus, who is the Christ, and whose words we, we, we continue to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now please stand as we sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of For the Beauty of the Earth, hymn number 28. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 to 37. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table 
eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Ginny and Deborah, Cindy and Carolyn. I do have a couple of people I'd ask you to keep in your thoughts and prayers, open your heart to. Eloise Post is now home. She went home yesterday. She's made wonderful progress this week, so we're really grateful for that. And then we mentioned last week to continue to keep uh, Linda Knightley in your prayer. She's undergoing chemo treatment right now. And I'm certain many of us have things in our heart that we want to remember. Prayer is a, a deeply personal thing, and lots of people have different thoughts. And when I pray, I pray not to get the attention of God. I'm not in an arm wrestling match trying to get God to do something that God wouldn't otherwise do. But I, when I pray, I pray so that the people who hear me and myself might be called to attention and that we might ask, what can I do? What can I do to make a difference? So let us be in a spirit of prayer.
on this day and at least for the rest of this day. Let us determine that we will have grateful hearts, that we will be mindful of life's many blessings, that we will be willing to expand our capacity for love, not only for others, but for ourselves. We hold open our hearts to dear friends who are hurting. We pray for people in this congregation and in our families, for those who are struggling. May they discover strength. But may we also be prompted to do what we can. And now we give thanks for all those people throughout the world who this very moment are so dedicated to making their communities more peaceful, more open, and more supportive, especially to those with needs. Let us always be such a people and always eager to join hands with anyone working for the common good. This is our prayer. Amen. Uh, before I introduce the next piece, I uh, just wanted to remind everyone that the choir will have their triumphant return next Sunday. We're very excited. Uh, we did our... Yes, very... Yes, clap for the choir. Yes. Um, we are going... We meet every Thursday at 6 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. If you want to join us, it's open to everyone. No auditions needed. <laughs> this piece is called on Wings of Song, and it's an arrangement of a piece by Mendelssohn. Thank you, Will and AJ. That was beautiful. I love it when the two of you play. And uh, the best thing about having the two of them here is if you add their ages up, they're still younger than most of us. <laughs> I, I hope you listened carefully to the gospel, and it should trouble you, the reading. Most days during the summer, if you stop by the office, you'll notice that I'm rather casually dressed. Shorts, a polo shirt, although I've never ridden a horse or played polo, <laughs> and bright sneakers. But occasionally during the week, I have dress-up days when I, wear, when I need to wear my big boy clothes, suit, tie, dress shoes. And this was one of those days. A prominent businessman from Methuen was coming to see me when we were back in Methuen. 
I didn't know him, but I knew of him. And we were doing some significant renovation in the church. And while he wasn't a member, he did believe in what we were doing. Early in the week, he called and said, Michael, I would like to come and see how I can support this project. And so I brewed some coffee, bought some pastry, straightened up my office, and I put on my marrying and burying suit. <laughs> I even polished the shoes. Then I heard the door open at the far end of the hallway. I walked out to meet him. But it wasn't the man I was expecting to meet. Now, in Methuen, we frequently got visitors who needed some help, a meal, a room to spend the night in, or gas, food. And so I looked at my watch and I realized I only had a few more minutes to deal with this man before my benefactor would be coming. So I needed to deal with this situation promptly. I started to say, I'm sorry, but I don't have much. But he interrupted me, extended his hand, and introduced himself. Despite the blue jeans and wrinkled flannel shirt, this was no homeless man coming for a handout. This was my guest coming to give me a check for $30,000. Fast forward another seven or eight years, I'm now the pastor of the Guilford Community Church. A disheveled man walks into the church office, I've got a busy day. So when I see him coming, I immediately begin planning, planning my strategy for how I can get him out of here as quickly as possible. I open my desk drawer and I look for a Hannaford gift card. Maybe that will do the trick, methinks. Of course, he comes not for a handout, but he comes bearing a check for $2,000 because he thinks the church is doing a great job. A great job, he repeats. I resist the temptation to point out, yeah, well, maybe we aren't doing such a good job. I never cease to amaze myself. I think I'm in the slow learner's class at becoming a good human being. And as I read the gospel story, I couldn't help but think of those two meetings. Like Jesus, let this sink in, like Jesus, I was quick to be judgmental, quick to dismiss someone, not because of their nationality, but because of their appearance. Every time I read this story, I get a little worked up. I don't understand how Jesus could behave this way how he could treat this lady the way he does. I wasn't sent for people like you, he says. Religion too often does that. It creates a distance between people. It invents us and them instead of bringing people together. Now, it's far easier for me to see prejudice in Jesus in this story or in others than it is to see in myself. Our daughter Katie recently visited She's in Italy this morning. If you're watching, Katie, shame on you. <laughs> but she visited, and we were out for a walk, and, and in a very loving way, she reminded me that I am often quite judgmental about certain people. She mentioned the two adjectives I frequently use to label people. And when I label them, they become less human. And once they're less human, it's easier to discard them. This was a prejudice that I learned from my parents, and when I would see it in them, it bothered me. And yet I was completely blind to seeing it in myself. In his most recent book, the Dalai Lama wonders if the world might be better if there were less religion, and I think he might be onto something. Today, religion and politics are about the most divisive thing around. And sadly, they seem to feed on each other. Like all of us, Jesus inherited a cultural map. And it was a map that was conflicted because one voice in that tradition said you need to welcome the foreigner because you were once strangers in a foreign land. But the louder voice declared that foreigners were bad people and they're to blame for all of our woes 
we're the chosen, they aren't. And sadly, too many people, maybe some here, think that Jesus came out of the womb pre-programmed. But that does such a disservice to the real Jesus, who we're told grew in wisdom and stature. Like Jesus, we all inherit a cultural map. And those create distances between people. But thankfully, like Jesus, we are capable of change, of seeing others in the world differently. And that's exactly what happens in this story. And if it bothers you to realize this, I'm sorry, but Jesus at the beginning of the story was a jerk. But because growth is always possible, his map is altered, and his worldview becomes a little larger. And it does so when he made space in his heart for a foreign woman. And what triggers this, vo- this growth is the voice of a desperate Canaanite mother, a longtime enemy of Israel. But she cries out, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And I think Jesus heard those words, even the dogs, even the dogs, they must have pierced the very heart of Jesus, tenderizing his heart, opening his eyes, so that he could see what was standing before him or who was standing before him, not a dog, but a desperate mom whose little girl needed some help. That's one of my hopes for our communities and our nation. That this moment that find us, continues to find us so fractured, when others are still demonized and scapegoated for all of our problems. So easy when we do that to picture them as less than human. I hope we might learn from the Jesus who emerges from this story that our hearts like his might be tenderized as we come to recognize in the face of others not something to be feared but someone to be loved. Amen. And now, quite symbolically, we gather around this table as we remember that ancient story that goes something like this, that on the night that Jesus would be betrayed, he took a loaf of bread. He blessed it, and he broke it, and he said, my body will be broken like this bread has been broken. And then he took a cup of wine, ordinary wine, and he said, my life will be poured out like this cup is poured out. Do it. Drink it in remembrance of me. And so now ministering to you in his name, we offer to each other the bread of life. And now in his memory, we share the cup, the cup that invites us to taste and know the love of the Lord. And now please stand as we close this service singing verses 1, 3, and 4 of hymn number 565, God Who's Giving Knows No Ending.
thank you for coming out this morning. I thank you for your understanding on returning to wearing masks. Again, hopefully that will be a short period of time that we need to do this, but we are committed to being responsible. Thank you for watching. And there's a new book coming out at the end of September that I think is an appropriate benediction. It goes along with the sermon. It says simply, if God is love, don't be a jerk. <laughs>